Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. We're your hosts and real life sisters who binge on historical drama. We'll talk about films, fictional adaptations, and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. So fill your teacup or mug with your favorite sip as we explore what's fact, what's fiction, and the so what on historical drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, where we talk about historical films and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Listen to past episodes and sign up for our newsletter on our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters to stay up to date on new episodes and bonus content. Each season, Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters produces a podcast by request by one of our newsletter subscribers. We selected the Hulu series, The Great, requested by Marsha Weiner, a food enthusiast who lives in Minnesota. Tequina and I share Marsha's enthusiasm for food, food culture, and history, which is why we were excited to connect with Sam Dixon, food stylist for The Great's second and third seasons. Sam is a home economist, food stylist for television and film, cookbook author, and has her own food photography studio in the UK. We'll talk with Sam Dixon in part two of this By Request podcast for a behind-the-scenes look at food in the great. The Great was created by Tony McNamara based on his 2008 play on the rise and fall of Catherine the Great of Russia. The series features Elle Fanning as the idealistic future ruler of Russia, Catherine the Great, and Nicholas Holt plays her offensive yet charming husband, Emperor Peter III. Incorporating historical facts occasionally, The Great is a satirical comedic drama about the rise of Catherine the Great from outsider to the longest reigning female ruler in Russia's history. Hulu describes The Great as a fictionalized, fun, and anachronistic story of an idealistic, romantic young girl who arrives in Russia for an arranged marriage to the mercurial Emperor Peter. Hoping for love and sunshine, she finds instead a dangerous, depraved, backward world that she resolves to change. All she has to do is kill her husband, beat the church, baffle the military, and get the court on her side. The Great is a very modern story about the past, which encompasses the many roles Catherine played over her lifetime as lover, teacher, ruler, friend, and fighter. In addition to Fanning and Holt, the cast includes Phoebe Fox as Mario, Adam Godley as Archbishop Archie, Willem Lee as Grigor, Charity Wakefield as Georgina, Douglas Hodge as Velimentov, Sasha Dewan as Orlo, Bayo Gobadamosi as Arkaji, and Belinda Bromelo as Aunt Elizabeth. We begin our conversation with Marsha Wiener. As a food enthusiast, Marsha Wiener was regional governor of Slow Food USA and put on monthly events about a wide range of food culture issues. Marsha produced Slow Food on film in collaboration with the American Film Institute, or AFI. As chair of the Slow Food Arc of Taste Biodiversity Committee, she uplifted the appreciation of the pawpaw, a custard apple indigenous to the mid-Atlantic region the fruit became recognized as the hipster banana. Here, in her own words, is why Marsha requested the great for our podcast. Hello, Boston sisters. Okay, so why did you want us to talk about the great? I have to tell you, I've 
I'm really quite shocked that you decided to talk about The Great. It seemed quite a dramatic departure from the dramas that you usually feature on the podcast, but I'm delighted that you did. I I stumbled, I think I, I stumbled into it during the beginnings of COVID. And what captured me initially was the subtitle. When they very brazenly Hulu had on the screen an occasionally sometimes true story. And I thought, what a great break for early COVID. So the satire really captured my my attention. And once I started to watch, I fell in love with the characters and the ensemble acting. I thought the acting the actors were great. I thought the writing was crisp and sharp and funny. And it was a great departure from early COVID. Yeah, it was quite shocking in many ways. Not, not just for us to do it on the podcast, but it was shocking and well done. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I got totally hooked into it, completely hooked into it. So let's talk about that occasionally a true story subtitle. Um, in what way did the great pique your curiosity about the real Catherine and Peter, if at all? Did you do a search? Um, I have to say I did. Um, and did it make any difference in how you watched and enjoyed the series? Well, I tell you, I have a pass- I've always had a passing interest in Catherine the Great as a woman who obtained power and her efforts to want to bring ideas of the Enlightenment to Russia always interested me. I never did a deep dive into it, but a couple of years ago, I was tutoring a high school student and he had to do a picture, he had to do a paper about a character from Russian history and Catherine the Great was on his list of possibilities. So together we did a little bit of an exploration so I was, you know, it, 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 she, always, she always captured my interest in imagination. But during the season of watching all the different seasons of the production on Hulu, I never once did a search. I did not want to spoil the absolute glee I had while watching the series. I didn't want reality to interfere with that or historical fact to, like, get in my head. So I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I did totally the opposite. <laughs> that's why it's your podcast. That's what yeah, that's why we do this podcast. That's your job. Uh, what character in the great did you most identify with? Huh. Well, I think the two well, the, the two characters that most intrigued me were Archie and Aunt Elizabeth. I loved them. And I thought the actors were just superb. But in terms of who I related to, hmm, probably Mariel. I think she was the most um, observant. She knew court from all sides. I think she had genuine um, feelings. She was very uh, forthright and outspoken. Sometimes it got her into trouble, but it also, I think she had real relationships. So I think she's the one that um, I most could connect with. And that kind of character actually provides the glue in a drama because often you do need someone who knows both sides or it can be a bridge between the newcomer and the culture, you know, that whole fish out of water experience that they find themselves in. So, yeah. I mean, she had deep history with Archie. She had deep history with all the women of court. Mm -hmm. And she yet was the fresh face for Catherine. So to your, I understand exactly what you mean by being a bridge. I think she had the, she had the, the most in-depth and fullest perspective of, of what was going on there. For sure. And she loved Peter's best friend. Yeah, but so her marriage she, was just so funny. I know. Her real marriage. <laughs> <laughs> we won't give it away for our audience. You have oh to see gosh. it. Oh, my gosh. And by the way, for our, because we are getting audience who are under the age of 18, 
Hulu has, this is for mature audiences. The Great is for mature audience. So I just want to make a note of that. All right. And Marcia, then there's the food in The Great. What was it about the food angles that appealed to you in telling the story about power, politics, and Catherine and Peter's personalities in marriage? Well, it, it's so easy to despise Peter. I mean, how can you like someone who would, in, in the whim of a moment, want to chop your head off or any any other body part. I mean, it's he's so easy to dislike. If there was any redeeming quality to him, I think it was his appreciation of food. And given his station in life, he wasn't a glutton. He was like this culinary savant that would be inspired by a conversation or something he saw outdoors and come up with a recipe that would be perfect to celebrate that moment. So he wasn't just a slovenly consumer of whatever he didn't he didn't care if the serfs were hungry. He didn't but he had this if joy can be a saving character trait, his joy was in food. And he was generous with that joy. He may then serve it up with your head on a platter, but when it came to the actual experience I think he was, um, that's, it really intrigued me in that regard. And that's why I think when he, when I won't get into, I don't want to be a spoiler, so I won't say what happens later on, but when he's not around, it's not as colorful. It's not as the joy is gone. And for me, I saw that he had real joy with all of the wonderful sensory experiences we can have with food. Well, he certainly had very strong ideas about what made a dish work and what made it not work. And we see that even in the first season in his interchange with the chef. Yeah, yeah. And that's Peter's huzzah. So um, we have to, <laughs> we can't leave this conversation without saying that. Um, how do you interpret huzzah? Huzzah. Um I saw that movie about um, Queen, the rock and roll band, and it oh, yeah. opened. It, uh, it opened with the the, the uh, benefit concert, and and there and there's the and there's the singer. There's um, there he is having this um, responsive singing with the audience, and at the end he says, "All right." And this whole stadium says, all right. And to me, that's the spirit of huzzah. I'm sure there's <laughs> probably a military route to it. It probably in there is like off with their heads. But for me, it's, it's with other people, this, it's like hallelujah or amen. It's a collective gusto approval of the moment. That's what huzzah is to me. And Peter also wants, when he says huzzah, he wants to hear that huzzah come right back at him, too. Absolutely. It might not be a moment that you feel it, but, but you got to bring it. In this part of our By Request podcast, we're talking with Sam Dixon, a food stylist for the Hulu series, The Great. Who plays a major role in the satirical comedic drama about the life of Catherine the Great of Russia? Sam Dixon is a self-taught food stylist for cookbooks, magazines, film, and television, learning her craft through the industry with a background in baking. She officially started her career in food at Violet Bakery in East London. A love for seasonal ingredients, creativity, and aesthetics was developed there. Since then, she has worked with numerous publications and brands such as The Guardian, GQ, The Telegraph, Hicks, The White Company, Kyle Books, Quadrille, and Hotter and Stoughton. She is also the co-creator of Studio Feast, a food photography studio at Leighton in East London. Sam was a food stylist for seasons two and three of The Great. 
Hello, Sam. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. Hi, thank you for having me. So how did you become a food stylist for television and film? Um, so I, when I became freelance after being a baker, I was assisting lots of food stylists because I, I just wanted to be a food stylist. And my friend who works in film, he does props, told me that there was a food stylist who did fi- like scenes in film. And I was just like, that's crazy. I really want to do that. I, I'd love that. Um, I never even thought about food being in film because it's such a subtle thing normally. Um, so yeah, I emailed her and I started assisting her. Luckily she needed someone. And I remember the first job that I did, which was a night shoot on Tarzan doing like (laughs) stew (laughs) around a campfire. (laughs) And it was just like madness to me, but I I loved it. So yeah, I just went, went from there really. (laughs) <laughs> but what, which Tarzan was that? Was that the Brendan Fraser? Um, no, it that. was the one with Alexander Skarsgård. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, that was Tarzan, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I got it totally wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was George of the Jungle you're thinking of. <laughs> ah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Right, based on the cartoon. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> Uh, but yeah. um, well, part of this by request podcast includes uh, at the beginning of this there, um, we were with Marsha Wiener, who um, asked for us to talk about the great. And um, we asked her if she had any questions for you. So here's Marsha's questions uh, for you, Sam, about the food in the great. I'm curious, given that Tony McNamara played pretty loose with the historical facts. I'm wondering if she felt the same about the food, you know, or did she really dig into any historical uh, documentation to try to replicate anything accurate? Or if she, if she was given a wide range of choice and if so, what choices she made and why and how much real food was on the set? Um, I would say that, it was not factual (laughs) it was definitely (laughs) for comedic value a lot of the time there were some ridiculous requests for food that were definitely just part just added to the comedy for it a lot of the I I got asked to make things like badger flan and mousselet pate and (laughs) gooseneck sausage I think there was one it was just like sure okay I'll try and make that it definitely wasn't authentic to the time it was yeah I think they didn't yeah Tony McNamara did not seem to mind about the authenticity that's for sure um was it it authentic to the ingredients (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not the way that I made it, no. <laughs> I didn't I definitely didn't use any badges in the badger flan. Um it was just yeah, I think mainly for the fun of it. And it was also because it was just such a indulgent and like like flamboyant and extravagant show. It was more about showing of wealth and like also Peter just being like ridiculous um yeah I think that's why it just definitely wasn't authentic (laughs) I tried to make some of the food like authentic to like 18th century Russia as much as I could but there definitely wasn't a sense of it needing to be very authentic like on on other shows I've been on they yeah they didn't seem to mind too much about that kind of thing and um and the other question about the real food and most of it was real. I always used ed, like f- food materials apart from some things because a lot of things had to be left on set for a long time and food does not last that long. So it would be like a cake that had poly- that was just polystyrene but covered in icing or a pie that was full of oats, not meat, just stuff like that really. But yeah, mostly it was, I tried to use as much real food as possible. Yeah. 
So you said some of it was you tried to incorporate actual 18th century Russian cuisine. Does that mean you were doing some a little research to see what might have really been on those plates? Yeah, a little research. It was between me and the set. So the set deck team, the set decorators were the ones that hired me. And it would be like uh, definitely a combination of us like giving each other references or doing a bit of research. Um, they had already done a lot of research on the sets and how things should have been decorated. So it was just a case of like figuring out what kind of food would have had a place in whatever scene we did. Yeah. But yeah, we tried to keep it as accurate as possible, but also could have a bit of fun with it. It was definitely over the top for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was definitely the most over the top show that I've ever worked on. <laughs> but that was why it was so much fun. So yeah, it's yeah. good. We know that actors and <clears throat> designers and um, directors start with the script. Did you have any interaction with the script uh, in making your decisions about the food in the series? Um, only in the sense of like, if something wouldn't quite work or it didn't, I'm trying to think of like the an example, but um, mainly they would tell me what was in the script, whatever hero scripted food that they would want to definitely show and then I would try and interpret that in my own way as also the set deck team would give me references of what they thought that that would be and then we'd kind of go from there and but we we try I tried to keep it we they wanted me to like keep to the script as much as possible but yeah if it was like an interpretation of it and if it as long as it worked and it could be edible also sometimes if the actor was vegan or gluten-free and it was something that wasn't vegan or gluten-free then we'd have to like make something completely a version of what they wanted so it was just a lot of yeah a lot of kind of teamwork and trying to <laughs> work around it I guess yeah I think there's probably a lot of food considerations these days between allergies yeah. and yeah yeah. A lot. <laughs> there's, yeah there's been times where I've been asked to make um basically a turkey leg but oh the act is vegan and I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's gonna sure <laughs> and I've tried to make it like there's only so much you could do really with vegan meat substitutions to make a thing with a bone but yeah it's it's happened so yeah <laughs> there's a yeah, lot of stuff that, like that that, <laughs> that tofurkey doesn't quite hold up the same yeah. way <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> Well, that leads us to a question about interpreting food for the actors. And we've heard stories where actors are like, oh, God, that fish has been sitting here for like three hours, but we're supposed to. Or like you said, you made some things that were supposed to be meat, but it was actually oatmeal. So what was it like interpreting the food uh, that was going to be in the scene for the actors? Um, well, it was okay, more or less. I mean, the main actors were very easy. They, Peter especially, was happy to eat anything. Like, it was quite easy to get him to eat stuff. <laughs> like, I think I once had to make, um, he would eat a whole truffle in a scene, which is probably not very pleasant to eat. Like a, you know, the truffle, like a truffle that you'd shave over your pasta, not like a chocolate truffle. But, um, so I would obviously to make it edible, make something. I think I made it out of marzipan in the end and just dusted it and made it look like a truffle. And I think that's, it was more a case of me trying to make something that was more edible for an actor to eat because they did get asked to eat ridiculous things. So I, I think that was what I tried to do for them. Um, and there's definitely a scene a couple of scenes where Archie another character has to eat a lot of magic mushrooms but obviously you can't have an actor <laughs> eating magic mushrooms right. <laughs> so it would be like dried enoki mushrooms that looked like magic mushrooms um just I guess yeah that was how I tried to interpret food for an actor 
We were really curious about the heart that Catherine, the human yeah. heart that Catherine was supposed to eat. How did you construct that human heart? Well, weirdly, I had recently made a human hand that was edible, <laughs> so, <laughs> as you do. Um, so I already kind of knew how to like what materials and ingredients would work for something like that. I ended up using seitan, you know, that like meat oh, substitute. Yeah. Um, but I dyed it. I think I like got a salami recipe, like a vegan salami recipe and kind of um, half used a um, mold for a heart and half kind of like just, you can kind of shape it yourself. And um, yeah, it was a bit of that and a lot of food coloring, a lot of oil to make it like look really like kind of glisteny. And luckily it was charred. So that kind of hid a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I think I got a tip from another food stylist to use pasta as tubes for the arteries. So oh, I kind of like put them in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just how that worked. It was very odd, but yeah, it was fun. Cause I, luckily I had just done that other weird thing. So I was like, sure. Yeah. Human heart. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, other than creating a turkey leg out of nut turkey, <laughs> what were some of the other challenges that you remember working with food on the set? Um, that was definitely the biggest challenge, but I remember having to make whale sashimi. There was a, there's like a dream sequence with, um, yeah, where he, Peter's eating whale sashimi and obviously you can't really get whale sashimi and they didn't really want him to be eating raw fish so I I mean I didn't even know what whale sashimi would look like but I had used poached pear and poached quince as tuna mm. and salmon sashimi before oh. so I kind of used that but then I colored a bit of like the outer layer of it pink so it kind of looked unusual and the director really liked it so that that was what was used in the end for <laughs> whale sashimi um oh. but yeah i think just other than the badger flam and the moose lip pate it was <laughs> usually quite normal but yeah stuff like that <laughs> it sounds to me whatever you created was definitely edible though i think al did struggle with the human heart because it was quite chewy <laughs> <laughs> and, like she was trying to like rip bits off of it but it was quite it was a bit tough tougher than probably it would have been like to have been but yeah other than that they have enjoyed they, I think they also actors of like they see something and if it looks horrible they're ready for it to be horrible so when it's like actually quite pleasant then they're generally quite happy <laughs> well the heart is a muscle so <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people love muscles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sam, uh, I know in Marsha's question about, you know, historical references for the food, uh, that you, you weren't a stickler for ac historical accuracy for the food itself, but definitely the presentation had, seems to have some historical references, like the plating of the food, the um, the yeah. staging, um, the platters and, and the um, utensils, et cetera. Um, how were you involved in the selection of those elements um, for, for the great? Well, that was mainly the set deck team. Like, they're the ones that hire the props, organize the props. Um, they would, for the great, they had a selection of things that they used for each um usually for each like set would have its own crockery. For example, Peter's breakfast room or the, the great like dining banquet room or Catherine's rooms would have her own kind of crockery as well. So they would always have this kind of stuff to hand, but they would just lay it all out for me. And then I would just choose what I thought looked right for each dish that I would have. And it was kind of more, yeah, it was all kind of, yeah, already chosen. So it was quite easy for me to like just pick what I thought looked right for the food that I had made, basically. Um, like a big platter for like a big thing of meat or the perfect size plate for a jelly or stuff like that, really. But yeah, it was mainly the set deck team that chose all those things. 
How do you think food tells Catherine and Peter's story and show their personalities in the great? I mean, is one savory and one sweet? Um, is- yeah, quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, basically, it was very like masculine food for Peter. A lot of um, ca- loads of caviar. There was caviar everywhere. Uh, and dark fruit as well, plums, dark grapes, figs, um, and meat and cheese and stuff like that. But for Catherine, it was definitely a lot more prettier things, biscuits, fruit, like berries, um, and cakes, cream cakes and things like that. So I think it was more just a feminine and a masculine side of things. But yeah, it was... I definitely, Peter was definitely the more like, this is what Peter always has. This is what he will always eat. It will be this. For Catherine, it was a bit more free. And usually she would put on dinners that were a bit more for, I guess, for more modern forward thinkers. So there would always be something a bit more modern on the table, something that was new to like Russia. I think it was just more about her kind of trying to like progress Russia and the way that they were thinking. So that was more her kind of vibe. Uh, that's fascinating because I think people always understand how costumes communicate character, but to think about character being communicated through food. Now I'm going to be looking at these historical <laughs> yeah. dramas every time there's an eating scene, very particularly yeah, yeah. in a different mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Yeah. No, food definitely. has become a big thing in film and television. There was a time yeah. that people didn't eat on on camera. Know, on camera, yeah. you know, they didn't want to see anyone chew. They didn't want no, to see yeah. the chewing, or there was always the potential food spewing out um, in <laughs> yeah. a scene. Yeah. But now it's or spoiling. Quite- now, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, costume definitely don't like eating, but uh, <laughs> but the director definitely always asks for the background, even the background actors to be eating. They want it to look as real as possible. So, yeah, I have noticed that that they definitely prefer it when people are eating. But um, usually, when there's a lot of dialogue, the actors do not want to eat, which is fair enough. You don't really want to be chewing <laughs> and. And did you have like a whole kitchen staff and other chefs that you were working with? I mean, what kind of crew did you have? I had, um, usually it was just me or for the bigger scenes, I would have an assistant or two, but it was mainly just me and there was no kitchen. (laughs) There was a a little cabin that we, that was like kind of the base for home, for food stylist. But um, yeah, it was usually... Yeah, no running water. Uh, yeah, just oh, a, a table, a table on the side of a very dusty soundstage. So, as you can imagine, food hygiene was probably quite hard to keep up, but I still tried. <laughs> but yeah, no kitchen, never a kitchen, sadly, on film. Well, here's an important question about your experience with the great, and that is, how do you interpret huzzah? <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's very much a celebratory thing. It's like cheers, but to a different level, to another level. It's um, no holds barred, do what you want. Yeah, let's have a party type thing, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> have you added it to your vocabulary? <laughs> no, but I have put it on a cake. <laughs> so... Maybe I should. Maybe I need to say it more. (laughs) Well, Sam, this is the time in our podcast that we call our lightning round when we ask our guests questions related to the podcast themes. So are you ready for our lightning round? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, Michonne's going to ask the first question. Okay, Sam, if you could travel to another time, where would you go or when would you go? Where, when would you go and what would you be eating? <laughs> um, I would probably go to the like Georgian era, the like early 19th century, just because 
of Anton Karen. I, I, I mean, I don't even know what, I don't know if you've seen those pictures of his like sculptural food. Like he was just a, a chef, a French chef who was like really celebrated in that time. And he was used by like King George and I think even Tsar Alexander. But, um, Wow. I've had to like mm. interpret his food before for films and TV and it I just don't even know what it is I'm looking at but it's just so ridiculous and I just I, I'm sure it probably didn't taste maybe it tasted great but it just looks so magnificent I would love to try that basically <laughs> so, yeah. and our second question is what three items would you put in a time capsule to represent the times that you've lived? Um, I think quite tough, but probably a jelly mold because I am obsessed with jelly and I do have quite a few that I love and I feel like they are quite timeless and maybe photo of me and my friends dancing and <laughs> I'd either say a bag of crisps or a snorkel I don't know <laughs> which one <laughs> but those represent me so <laughs> Sam thank you for joining us to talk about your experiences with making great food for the great <laughs> um, thank it you, certainly thanks. has lived up to its name the Great, created by Tony McNamara and featuring Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt, is available for streaming on Hulu. Note there is a fee for using the streaming service. We invite you to share this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters with someone you know who would enjoy the conversation. Subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters and enjoy past episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. You can write us at podcast at michonbostongroup.com. Like and share historical drama with the Boston Sisters on your social media. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast about historical films and series dramas. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Tell us what historical dramas you're watching. Who knows? We may do a show about it. Sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with the people you know who binge on historical drama. Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters is brought to you by the Michonne Boston Group. The views and opinions expressed on historical drama with the Boston Sisters are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions or views of the Michonne Boston Group, its clients or affiliates. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening.